When Janie was five, her parents had a silver van. Not a new, shiny van, mind you, but an old van, prone to rust and bad smells, with more holes than it was designed to have. The paint was no longer the shiny factor finish. Instead, it was the kind that comes in a can, the kind that you spray on to hide the rust, the kind that smells bad, and takes a strong finger pressing hard on the nozzle for the paint to come out. Janie was not strong enough. She had tried and failed on more than one of her father's attempts to expand her experience of the world. Janie thought the van looked like someone had covered it in tinfoil after being crumpled into a ball and then carefully spread out on a table to smooth out the wrinkles, but forgetting to remove the crumbs from the table first. Wrinkled, bumpy, and showing signs of more than one type of paint. Apparently silver comes in many types, as displayed on the side of her parents' van. The van sat in front of a rundown house where Janie lived with her parents, her brother, some of her parents' friends, and a single mother with one son, who rented the bachelor apartment just off the kitchen. The house was at the top of a hill, piled on top of even more dirt than any of the other houses on the block, at an intersection of two streets. On one side, a street that plunged down a steep hill ended at a busy intersection. The intersection was of no interest to Janie, but the chicken on the run, well, well that was endlessly interesting, kind of mysterious, and absolutely forbidden. When Janie was five, her parents were vegetarians. The kind that ate eggs and milk, insisted on sturdy leather shoes, but did not eat chicken, beef, or fish and her parents were very strict on this account. Even french fries were not allowed. They are cooked in the same oil as the chicken. They are tainted, her mother would say. So Janie imagined the fast food joint a den of wickedly delightful pleasures instead of the run-down fat fryer that it was. The house matched the aged van, a run-down crumbled Victorian. The owner had offered her parents a purchase price of 28000 a cheap price, even in the 70s, but it was still more than her parents could afford. One day, an architect would buy the house, renovate the interior, revive the exterior, and then sell the house for just shy of a million bucks. The once decrepit old lady, now one of the many painted ladies that graced the neighborhood. But when Janie was five, the house and the van alike or scrap heap rescues. When Janie was five, her brother Mike was still in diapers. Cloth diapers because they were reusable, not because they were cheaper. Like the compost in the backyard, the bin for used paper, and the bag for washed tin cans, Janie's parents practiced what they preached, except for the water. In later years, there would be many attempts by the city to build a plant to clean the water to educate the populace on how to reduce the contamination of the water supply and to improve the ocean ecology. But when Janie was five, the city did nothing. Her parents complained and everyone continued to wash their clothes with non-biodegradable soap. So although her brother's cloth diapers were reused, the energy and the water to clean them were not. Something Janie had tried to make her parents aware of, but instead they just got mad at her mad at the city, and nothing changed. Mikey, also called Mike, Michael, Mickey, my man, my little man, the gentleman, the ladies' man, mama's little boy, and a whole host of other cute and adorable nicknames, was still in diapers even though he was just shy of three because he was a boy. Janie had not needed diapers past age two, and though she understood only some of the feminist rantings of her mother and her mother's friends, it became abundantly clear to her that actions speak louder than words. Boys were allowed to make messes and girls were not. Boys had cute nicknames, but girls should be more serious, and parents were as observant as daft fuck. Yes, that word, a favorite of Janie's since before she turned five, summed up much of how she felt about the world which didn't comprise much more than about two block radius around her home. Originally, it was just fuck, and it was simple and perfect. 
But then one day, while watching TV at her grandparents, she heard a silly fat man, a British man, say daft. And it seemed like the perfect addition to her favorite word. Especially when her grandmother came into the room, saw what she was watching, and dragged her out. Not appropriate for girls was the reason given. As a whole, Janie found the word had many uses and many meanings. Said quietly under her breath, it was the perfect thing to say when she got caught stealing sugar cubes from a sugar bowl. Yelled as loud as possible was a very effective way to let the world know when she had stubbed her toe. Said matter-of-factly, with an accompanying eye roll, was often the best response to her mother's request to change her name again. No, Mom, Pia Sunshine would not be an improvement. But only when her mother's back was turned. Parents, daft fuck. Sex, daft fuck. Having to talk to your parents about sex, daft fuck. Drugs, daft fuck. Adults on drug, definitely daft fuck. Cleaning your bedroom, daft fuck. Hidden zucchini, daft fuck. Needles at the doctor's office, double daft fuck. Mellow yellow, daft fuck. Nipple rings, daft fuck. War, daft fuck. Having to attend peace marches, daft fuck. Good learning experiences, daft fuck. The other street, the one in front of the house, led to a hill, a park, an ocean. To reach any of these exciting destinations, Janie first had to pass through the largest patch of blackberries she will ever see. The maze of prickly vines was bisected by paths, many, many paths. Every summer and well into the fall, this looming patch of vines would produce the sweetest, largest, juiciest berries known to mankind. All the kids in the neighborhood would flock to the patch, eating and picking as much as they could. And no, they did not wash them first. They were natural, what was the harm? And no matter how many they picked, there was always, at least till the season ended, twice as much left behind. Janie's mother would use the berries to make a pie, but only if Janie agreed to call it humankind. Janie's father would insist that she make the pie as a learning experience. As she could not read a recipe, the crust was made with water and flour, and when the filling ran out, Janie used the only fruit left in the house, pink grapefruit. Learning the hard way? Daft fuck. More often than not, Janie would pass the silver van on her way to the berry patch. On its best day, the van worked about 50% of the time. The rest of the time it sat on the road, often missing parts, and skinny, long-haired, bearded men wearing t-shirts and bell-bottom pants mulled around and discussed the finer points of exhaust systems, fan belts, and engine pinging. If the van was unmanned, or unhuman, as her mother would insist, it was a great place to play, especially if it was cold and raining. Not that her parents would agree. Van play was strictly a do-it-till-you-get-caught-and-then-ask-for-forgiveness kind of activity. Mostly Janie and her brother would play race cars, taking turns trying to rotate the wheel, move the levers, and pump the pedals under the driver's side. It was the duties of the non-driver to make the, the accompanying sounds. Lots of broom, broom, screech, and bing, bang, boom. Almost always, the game would turn to a fight over whose turn it was to be the driver, or who had had a longer turn, and even who was the better driver. The doors on the van held superstar status, the kind you get when you burn down buildings or murder your husband. The doors earned their status not because they were known to fall off or look too banged up, but because the locks rarely worked. Not that Janie's parents or any of their friends noticed. They would actually have to lock the van to notice, something they never did. This made it easy for Janie and Mike to play as much as their parents' absence would allow. Sometimes her parents even left them in the van while they went shopping, visiting friends, 
or if they caught the early ferry and did not want to wake the kids sleeping in the back. The van only had two seats. If the whole family was out, Janie's parents would sit in the front and Janie and her brother would hang out and play on the old mattress in the back. If just one parent was in the van, then Janie could sit in the front seat and her brother would sit on the floor in between. Janie's parents had lectured her on the safety of being a passenger and how not to play with the door handle while the van was in motion. Janie would nod her head, agree with everything that was said, and then promptly forget it. It was much too boring to remember all of it. And besides, she did not trust their motives. There had to be another reason. Lectures on safe passenger behavior were kept in the same part of Janie's brain that held applesauce made from zucchini and needles that were not supposed to hurt. Never once did Janie's parents explain about the emergency brake. Occasionally, when they returned from a trip, dinner at Granny's, or a secret protest meeting in Vancouver, they would find another car, or many cars, parked in front of the house. Usually, this meant that someone on the block or in the house was having a party, and as her parents did not own the parking space in front of the house, or anywhere else in the neighborhood, they would park the van on the hill at the side of the house. The top of the hill that ran into the busy intersection. The hill that looked over the forbidden chicken on the run. The Christmas before Janie turned five, it snowed. Something it had never done before by Janie's calculations. And then it snowed again. And the city, not owing any snow removal equipment, let the streets pile up with the white stuff. And then days and days of cold weather, car tires, and the occasional sunny moment compacted the snow into ice. The silver van, while sturdy enough to stay together despite the weather, nonetheless did not have snow tires. Or as Janie's father said, it did have tires, but they were so bald they made Yul Brenner look furry. The van was relegated to the side of the house to make way for a newer car, borrowed from a friend who'd gone home for the holidays. Yes, that side. The side with the hill. Yes, that hill. For Christmas that year, Janie got a big wheel, just like her friend Jason. But it was too cold, and the sidewalks and streets too icy to try it out. As the cold weather stayed, Janie watched from the window, waiting for the dismal spell to end and take the ice with it. By the time Janie's birthday arrived, was celebrated and passed, she was utterly disgusted with the weather, her parents, and the lack of concern any of the adults displayed. Will it be gone tomorrow? She asked her mother many times. What if you used a shovel like the neighbor and cleaned out paths for me to play on? She asked her father. He did not look amused, taking off his glasses, resting one elbow on his other arm and rubbing his eyes and face before replying. You're being a turkey. Go find something else to do. Janie looked dejected and then even more dejected when her father ignored her and went back to the book he was reading, pulling on the tuft of hair below his bottom lip and humming to himself. Despite the many friends who were visiting for the holidays, crashing on the couch or someone's bed as they waited for the runway at the airport to clear so they could go home, no one wanted to shovel the driveway or the street so Janie could try out her new big wheel. Hey, do you even have a snow shovel? That remark got lots of laughs, apparently something only her parents' crazy friends would understand. Peace, man, mellow out, said a man sitting next to the fireplace. Janie left the living room in disgust and went to ask her mom. Of course not. What would we need that for? Janie's mom replied as she tore stalks from some leaves of spinach. Janie picked up a few stalks and ate them. Go outside. Try clearing the path yourself. Work off some of that energy. Janie's mother pushed her in the direction of the kitchen door. Janie scowled, but only as she left the room and her mother could not see her. Janie found Mikey playing Godzilla in the front hall, piles of toys being scattered in every direction as he stomped around in his pink hand-me-down onesie. 
Janie navigated through the maze of cars, colored blocks, kitchen pots, Lego, and stuffed animals, and then opened the front door. Mikey followed, the plastic feet of his onesie making crunchy noises on the hardwood floor as his fat little legs tried to lift his feet. Broom, broom, said Mikey, as he grabbed one of her fingers and held tightly. Race car? Janie looked down at the chubby face covered in dirt and whatever he'd eaten last. Broom, broom, he repeated, and pointed with his free hand to the side of the house. Janie put her middle finger to her lip, freed her other hand from his grasp, and motioned for him to stay while creeping softly back into the house to get shoes and coats for them both. Sneaking had become something of an acquired skill of late, and Janie practiced as often as possible. Though the why was not always clear, Janie suspected that her parents' self-involved proclivity provided more than enough motivation. She practiced not being heard by sneaking into an adult's room under the bed and back out. One can hear many strange noises practicing this one. She practiced not being felt by sneaking her father's wallet from his back pocket, much to the annoyance of her dad. She practiced not being seen by sneaking sugar cubes from the sugar bowl, which served two purposes, the one providing the much desired sweet, the other honing her knowledge of what adult would be where at what time. By the time she was five, Janie had become quite proficient at her craft. Her father was no longer annoyed with her, but only because he could no longer tell when she lifted his wallet or when she put it back. Her mother did not notice that the sugar bowl was depleting faster than it should be, as she was busy removing the flour from Mikey's face, hands, hair, and onesies. This had been a particular triumph, the inclusion of her brother as a diversion, which only worked for a while. Once Mikey realized that the flour was not sugar, his participation in the diversion ended. The bedroom sneaking went on for years, providing the knowledge that sex made you deaf and apparently hurt a lot, which accounted for all the screaming and moaning. It would take a long time before Janie's opinion on this subject would change. As usual, Janie's presence in the house went unobserved. And as usual, the parents assumed that one of them was with the children or knew where they were. And as they did not spend any time finding out which one of them this was, they all went about their activities ignorant of Janie's adventures. Finding the coat and shoes was more of a guessing game than any practice at sneaking, and eventually Janie's efforts rewarded her with two pairs of shoes and two adult jackets. Mikey looked like a deflated adult in his gear as he plodded after Janie. They walked down the steps, across the front yard, and around the bushes at the side of the house, now completely out of view. The van sat at the curb, its front facing the hill, it's back to the intersection. Eee! says Janie's brother as he pointed to the driver's side of the van. For a moment, she considered saying no, but then decided otherwise, her generosity getting the best of her. Mikey climbed into the driver's seat while Janie held the door open and helped with the high parts. Broom, broom, they shouted in unison as Mikey jerked the steering wheel back and forth and Janie sat beside him, stretching her legs as far as they would go to push on the pedals. They were so busy screeching and cheering, pulling levers, pushing pedals, driving as fast as they could, beating all the cars on the track, swerving around the corners. Janie would later insist she did not notice the van start to move. Not until the van started to speed up did she notice anything had changed. And boy, did the van speed up jerking wildly as it rolled down the hill across the front yards of many houses, taking the front corners off the last two houses on the street, to come finally to a stop after crashing through the back of the chicken on the run, spilling freshly cooked french fries over the windshield of the van. Janie and Mikey leaned out the window to pick fries off the front of the van and squeeze ketchup over each fry as the cook laughed a giant belly laugh. But that didn't really happen. In part, it was her parents who actually held legal driver's licenses, acquired after practicing for a long time, taking a test, and then fine-tuning their skills with many years of driving. 
So when the van had to be parked on a hill, or any hill, they turned the front wheels in the direction of the curb, ensuring that if the emergency brake was to fail, the van would roll only a short distance before hitting a curb and coming to a stop. Afterwards, and for the rest of their lives, Janie's parents would ensure that not only were the tires turned inward, but that the steering wheel was locked and that any car they bought in the future had a fully working emergency brake. And that they pointed out exactly where the emergency brake was and not to touch it at any cost. They still left the van unlocked though. Janie always wondered how her parents had found out. Was there someone looking out an upstairs window who saw the van move? Were she and Mikey screaming so loudly that her parents actually heard them and came rushing to save them? Did her mom possess a mother's intuition and know when her children were in danger? Did her father change his mind and come out to shovel the road and notice the van missing? No. Not only did the van not go careering down the hill, it in fact only traveled the distance of two houses, following the now slightly less turned wheels through the neighbor's driveway and onto their lawn. And while an older gentleman helped the kids from the van, his wife ran the short distance up the hill to get their parents. It was wholly true that Mikey was the one near the emergency brake. It was absolutely true that the emergency brake was way too easy to release, allowing Mikey's fat fingers to grip the brake and his weaker child strength to pull the lever up and pop the brake. It was also completely Janie's fault an injustice experienced by every older sibling for no other reason than she should have known better. She was more grown up than Mikey. Janie looked at her parents in disbelief, their ignorance of her true age, a mere five years old, only a few years older than her brother, and still very much a child, was impossible to fathom. So Janie gave up trying, started to cry, and agreed wholeheartedly to be better in the future. The next time Janie and Mikey played in the van, Janie made sure they were quiet, that the van was parked in front of the house on the flattest part of the street, and that Mikey did not touch the emergency brake, ever. All would have been well, except that Mikey discovered that their parents had finally fixed the horn, giving him great pleasure in banging his chubby fists on the steering wheel as hard as he could. And it was utterly Janie's fault. Thank you.